Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents podcast, a conversation with comedian Lamont Price, plus new music from Even Twice. I'm your host, Nick Zeno. All right, enough of that crap. This is the Department of Tangents special Joy of Halloween and Horror episode with Lamont Price. I love Halloween and so does Price, and that's really the only inspiration for this episode. Price is an incredibly entertaining human being, so we just sat down with no real notes and not much of an agenda other than to discuss why we love the holiday, horror movies and books, what scares us and what doesn't. We talked about trick-or-treating as kids and how that was part of the first taste of independence you got. We go through all the major creeps and spooks to weigh in on how they scare us or don't. Ghosts, zombies, werewolves, vampires, serial killers, aliens. To prepare for the episode, we went to a couple of different Halloween stores before we taped. You can watch Price's Instagram to see if any of those videos from those visits pop up. Until then, enjoy Price rocking out as Slimer on his Twitter page, which you can see at www.departmentoftangents.com over on the blog. Stick around after the conversation for new music from Even Twice. And now, here's Lamont Price on Halloween. Welcome to our Halloween celebration episode of the Department of Tangents podcast. This is the first one I have done with absolutely no notes and only a few questions in mind. So we're just going to talk Halloween and scariness and see where that leads us. The unprepared Halloween special. With Mr. Lamont Price, who (sighs) you've heard on previous episodes talking about Godzilla, Mystery Science Theater, and Kids in the Hall. That's right. You bring me in for the quirky stuff. I love it. Yeah. Well, I, I feel like when I, I bring you in, it's better just to have a few questions and see where the the uh, the conversation goes. I yeah. Feel like you, when I bring a list of questions to an interview with you, I wind up not getting to half of them anyways because we naturally and the, it's called the Department of Tangents. So we go off on tangents. Let's go. So the place we're going to start is. Just with Halloween, what do you love about Halloween? Why is this the most wonderful time of year? I don't know. I love all of it, first of all. I love all of it. Uh, I think it's, as an adult, it's a time of year where, you know, it's almost okay with society if you're a bit immature. You know, you get to go out and have some fun and you can dress mm-hmm. up and nobody looks at you weird. And uh, uh, But, I mean, as a person who would do that even if society frowned upon it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just love the time. It might be. I think I've come to grips recently with my love of fall. That's really, yeah, that's autumn. A lot, that's a big part of it for me. The, I love the autumn. Christmas in the air. Yeah. Leaves change color, right? Like, uh, I, It's weird, though, because it does coincide with like back to school. Mm-hmm. And that was never fun. When I was a kid, I didn't. Like, oh, I gotta go back to school like again. Uh, <laughs> we just we just did that. <laughs> Doing well, this again. It also seems like the start of the best, you know, three or four months of the year as well. Because it, not only is it Halloween time, it's gonna be Thanksgiving time shortly, mm-hmm. and then it's gonna be Christmas time and New Year's time. And it's I love Halloween. Halloween is is probably my favorite of that. But it's the start of something, and it's also the start of football season, which I can't yep. I can't get myself to stop watching football. I've tried to kind of stop because it takes up way too much. I time. have tried to stop. I here's what I here's so you know I'm a Patriots fan, right? Mm-hmm. Here's where I've come to. I can't just go cold turkey. You know, you want to talk about social justice and stuff, and I don't agree with anything the NFL stands for as far as that goes. But just kind of. It's just part of what I do. Mm-hmm. And I do respect people who can just go cold turkey. I can't. It's hard to do. So I've done this. And maybe this is cheating. I don't know. I've just stopped caring mm-hmm. <laughs> if my team loses. I don't. I used to throw things. Not throw. But you know what I mean? Like I used to be, oh, God, I can't believe this. Ugh. Yeah, so get, I was much yeah. more invested in it yeah. than, I, than I am now. Because you get in, invested in the idea of being a fan. Like, this is yeah. what a good fan does. Yeah. 
but it, it is it, it is an essentially fall sport. I feel like every sport should be played outside. I feel like basketball should be played outdoors on grass. I just like <laughs> on outdoors, grass. So yeah, basketball on grass <laughs> that'll help the bouncing of the ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to impress me? Yeah. Play with this. <laughs> play this basketball on grass. There you go. I want to see a snow basketball game. Ah. <laughs> But it's part of that. It, it's a, a great fall sport. People are, are outdoors, and, and well, if you look it, at this, it, if you look at this time of the year, anyway, it's like a great. Uh, you got, you have baseball playoffs. Hmm. Football's going strong. Hockey just starts up. Basketball's on the way, so you get preseason games, and it's all happening at the same time. There's no. What other month is like that? There's no other month like that. I mean, there's no football in the spring. Well, there's when, just a lot of general excitement in the air, and the, the yeah. and Halloween and and Halloween. school starting up. It, it's this fall to me is the beginning of my year, much more than people would say would say spring's sort of the beginning. Fall to me is the beginning of a cycle. More spring to me. is for me. Mm-hmm. The only part of the year I'm not, I don't really vibe with, is that time like right after Christmas, New Year's is over. And it's January, February. I mean, you got sports, you got football, but it's dreary. It just looks. You've got two weeks of what have I done with my life? Yeah, <laughs> it's like if it's a really snowy and cold winter, you know, you feel like you feel like when Luke was lost on Hoth. You just <laughs> yeah. like when's somebody gonna come rescue me? So spring, it's it's to me, it's like everything after this because it get it's warmer. I can enjoy the warmth. Summer's coming, right? Mm. And then after that, it's just Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas. So what did Halloween mean to you as a kid? That's where everybody, that's where that's sort of in, implanted or imprinted upon you. Is, is if, you had a, if you loved Halloween as a kid, usually you'll love Halloween as an adult. Oh, yeah. I, I, why did I love it as a kid? Uh, is that an answer? Is, is that a question that you can even answer? Because... I knew I I loved Halloween before I was aware that I love Halloween. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what tr- like what made me go. This is my holiday. I just I, well, there must have been some experience. This feeling of on. it. There's um, you know what it it it's not a predictable holiday in a way where you know as in costumes and mm-hmm. what can scare you and you know we just came from a a spirit Halloween. So spirit Halloween. You have so to things get ready can jump this. out. You don't know. It's I'm a, I, I like possibilities, mm. and Halloween is one of those holidays where it's just like anything can happen. And I love horror movies for the same reason. It's like what can happen, right? In yeah, this I was going to say that that's that's reflected in the literature and the movies, yeah, and the TV. Like there was an episode of the cartoon Ghostbusters. I saw somebody tweet about <laughs> this, where Sam Hain came and he, and Sam Hain was going to make. Halloween last 20, like all year round. Endless Halloween. And then the Ghostbusters showed up and fucked it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was like, why would you do this? Why would you do this, Peter Venkman? Well, I, I used to look for Lorenzo to... Music. Why would you do this, Lorenzo Music? <laughs> Voice of Peter Venkman. I would look forward to my costume every year. I was not terribly good at making. Uh, uh, costumes. I wasn't. Uh, not nah, me. I was. I could conceptualize them, but actually making a costume that looked like anything what I had in my head. The best I probably ever did was a Ghostbusters. Uh, was a Ghostbusters costume where I had a a blue jumpsuit that that was. You made uh, this lying around there. Yeah, there was already. I already had a blue jumpsuit, and I made a proton pack uh, nice. because I found a giant metal DDT canister with the spray gun, and I put a flashlight at the end of the spray gun. And I put cardboard over the uh, over the, the the canister on the back, so that the the canister that you would put in would remove. You could remove that from the from the top. And I took the the grate from the the, the, the top of the stove uh-huh. and pushed it through the cardboard, so it looked like the uh, the the accelerator. That's kind of genius level stuff. I never did anything like the closest I've ever done. When I was I, I might have been eleven to twelve. And uh, all my toys would be in the in my closet in my room. Mm-hmm. And every week I would I'd have to clean it out. And you know my parents made me clean my room. I got grounded one day, and I was grounded for like two weeks. And part of the grounding was I can't play with any of the toys that are in my closet. 
Anything that's outside the closet, I can play with those toys. Mm. Anything inside the closet, I couldn't touch for two weeks. And that's where all the good stuff was. <laughs> so what I ended up doing was I took some, I took a uh, notebook paper and I drew, this was like all my Transformers were in the closet. I drew Transformers <laughs> on notebook paper and I, and I cut them out like form fitting. I cut them out and I somehow made them transform and I was <laughs> fine with that. For two weeks, it doesn't compare to creating an entire suit with a proton pack, but that might be my closest sort of kid invention uh-huh. to getting around the fact that I couldn't play with my my uh, transformers in the closet. Well, mostly I would. You know, I remember when I was a little kid, and you'd get the uh, there's a there's actually a documentary on them now. Those little plastic costumes that you. I was would, gonna bring that up. What, what they were called? Um, there was a name. I forget what the the name of it, but but anybody who's a you know I'm uh, I'll be forty seven in two weeks. Anybody who grew up around that time knew those costumes. You would get this this plastic sort of suit you could wear with a hard plastic mask with a little hole for your eyes and, your and an mouth. even smaller hole for your nose. Yes, and uh, a rubber band basically keeping the mask on. And most everybody had one of those. I remember looking at, at what was it nickels or whatever the place the 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 five and dime that you'd have that i, I just realized how old that makes me I'm like go down to the five and dime but don't but don't do it before the milkman shows up no no get yourself a nice soda jerk <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> but we, you get that i remember i was so happy to have my batman costume when i was a kid that was almost more joy than Christmas, and I think it's a more collaborative holiday than Christmas is, uh, in a way, because you're walking around your neighborhood with your friends, you're you know you're complimenting your friends' costumes. It's more yes, more community oriented yes. than Christmas. Uh, when you left your house in your costume, and then you came out in the street, and all your friends were already out, and you just meet up, and it was it was a, there was um was an independence to it. Yeah. Right, it was like when you got your first bike, you felt sort of grown up in a way, and you got to, your parents were there; they were kind of off in the distance, but you were one with your crew of friends, and you were gonna go house to house, and we we're gonna beg for candy, and guess what? They gonna give us that candy, right? <laughs> like that was the best part. I used to go to my uh, my grandmother's house, and she would take me all around her neighborhood, and then drive me to other neighborhoods. <laughs> To, to walk around and, and get candy. This was after my sister stopped doing uh, stopped going uh, with me, and it was sort of just me walking around. I remember one year I, I went in that Ghostbusters costume. You walked around alone? I walked around alone for, for a, your, a couple of years. Where's your friends? Well, the, well, because my we, I grew up out in the country, so there wasn't oh. the next door neighbor was <laughs> was not really close enough. They just sent you out to the darkness. <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. Just go out at the end of the driveway. If you come back, dinner will be on the table. (laughs) Well, I remember going out in that Ghostbusters costume, and I I thought since I was uh, alone, I would come up with a little spiel. It would be a little more creative than just trick or treat. So they knocked out, and I think Ghostbusters 2 would come out, and I said, you know, Ghostbusters Defense Fund, some little spiel about how I was Ghostbusters collecting. I was a Ghostbuster collecting (laughs) money to, uh, to get the Ghostbusters back together. And the one house, I did it at exactly one house, and it was an older couple, and I think it was the uh, the the husband answered the door, and the wife must have heard from the couch what was going on and said, what's going on? And the guy just said, I think he's here from UNICEF. And I'm like, <laughs> so I just I was just defeated and said, trick, trick or treat, and I <laughs> got my candy and moved on. He didn't give you any money? He gave me he gave me candy. I had to I had to explain that I was a trick or treater on Halloween night because because I had made my little spiel and I was dressed up as a Ghostbuster and he thought I was collecting money for someone I get on Halloween night. We're the Ghostbusters. <laughs> We're ready to believe you. What? <laughs> I don't know what this kid's talking about. <laughs> Just give him some Kit Kats and tell him to get out of here. Do you remember? Was there a costume that uh, you were especially proud of? Oh, I didn't make any of mine. So, uh, my Freddy, co- I had a, um, I was Freddy Krueger for a couple of years. I think between uh, eleven, 
through 13, I want to uh-huh. say. I was because I just liked and I could do at that age for some reason I could do a Freddie impression. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was like the the class impressionist because mm-hmm. I could do I could do Freddy Krueger, I could do at the time I could do Macho Man Randy Savage, mm-hmm. and I could do Hulk Hogan. And you can't now. Um, I can't do Hogan anymore. I can kind of do Macho Man. Uh, I, I'm coming off a of cold, so it might not sound, but it's just kind of like um. <clears throat> Oh yeah, Hogan. Let me tell you something. WrestleMania Nine. I'm gonna have you in a squared circle. I'm gonna have Elizabeth at my side. Oh yeah. And then when I get you down for the one, two, three, I am gonna tell you. I'm a little bit nuts, Hogan. You don't understand. It's SummerSlam ninety. So like I would do that, and the kids would be like, "Whoa!" And I would I would charge like quarters. <laughs> to hear Hogan was I can't do Hogan I know it's not good anymore let me tell you something brother what you gonna do man like I used to be able to really do it then well that's a cadence and uh, that's why you just need the gruff voice you just need the here. cadence and then Freddy was just like you know ha 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 ha, ha. Freddy's back bitch you know a lot mm-hmm. you throw a bitch in it's at the a, end of every sentence and you were the man like it's almost it's a, a variation off the same voice the the three different characters a little bit or at least Hogan and Freddy are a little bit. I had a deep voice at eleven. <laughs> well, that was your first your first taste of performing. Then was was uh, doing impressions for your classmates. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, I I think I told I told you about this earlier. You know, when I was in seventh grade, they they took um, you know, when I hear about how kids they don't let kids yeah, you can always tell when I perform comedy at colleges. You can always tell how much they care about the students by what you're allowed to say. <laughs> right. So, like, if you're not allowed to say anything, they care about these kids, even though it's it's stupid the, the way they're going about it. Uh-huh. But if you're at a college and they go, eh, whatever, they don't, they don't give a fuck about those kids. When I was in seventh grade, they did something at our school which would make you believe that there's no way they care about those kids. <laughs> and uh, on Halloween Day, they brought the seventh and eighth grade class to the auditorium and they showed all of us a nightmare on elm street part three dream warriors with my <laughs> man king Cade. what's up king Cade? and they let us watch it at school and it's today you would never wouldn't you would never because i told you in the car and you were like what yeah why well, how old were you yeah, asked i was, how old I was were 12 you with- i was 12 years old and it, it wasn't was- weird to us for some reason it was just like i it wasn't even like we went home and told our parents about it. It was just whatever. Well, that was that was the uh, one with the Dokken video as well, right? Because the Dream Warrior, yeah, the Dokken Dream, where Dokken defeats Freddy. Yep. With the uh, uh, was it Lynch, the guitar player, with the uh, the the skull and crossbones guitar. That's the and best one. Dokken is more scary than than Freddy is, and they banish Freddy. At the end of that video <laughs> that's, the- <laughs> that's what that's where i had to sort of live with a lot of that stuff uh because we we didn't have cable when i was a kid me so neither. so all my st- uh, videos to me were friday night videos yep which they would show it was like an hour an hour and a half at one in the morning or something or at midnight uh and then uh any movies that i saw were from the video store which was I've heard people uh, in the last few days speak nostalgically about those VHS covers. Oh, dude! Of horror movies that they were drawn to. My move when I was a kid, when you get to that age, when you're a boy, you're like eleven, twelve, and thirteen, and you're starting to discover girls and that kind of thing, and you want to see, you know, when you go to the video store, it's kind of off topic, but. And, you know, my parents would always let us pick out, you know, pick out a movie for yourself. And the key was to get a movie that I knew had titties in it, (laughs) but it wouldn't be immediately obvious to my parents. I didn't care what the movie was. And the, (laughs) and, and the key was this, if the cover of the video was like a cartoon version of the events in the movie. Uh-huh. There were titties littered in that movie. It, <laughs> you're not going three scenes without a titty. <laughs> that was my move. Horror movies, comedies. I didn't. I didn't even care 
about the movies. I just wanted to find the boobs. That's all I cared about. And did your parents ever catch on Never. that that's what you were doing? No. If they did, they didn't let me know. Were, but were you drawn to the horror stuff? Were you a horror fan as a kid? Yes. Big time. Even when I couldn't handle it. Um, well, what couldn't you handle? What What were some things that... that uh, that spooked you out too much. When I was nine, there was a movie, it was a TV movie uh, called Don't Go to Sleep. And it, I think it originally aired in like the early 80s. Mm-hmm. And, but every couple years, it was an NBC movie and it would come, they would air it again. And it was, uh, it was uh, the late, great Valerie Hopper. She was the, the, the matriarch of this family. And the family basically is moving into a new house. Husband, wife, two kids, grandmother. Oh, right. I saw this a, a year or two ago, right? Okay. Yeah. And the kids are like, the the son is the older of the two. He's probably 10, 11 years old. The daughter looks like she's like six. And they had an older daughter who died in an accident that they couldn't rescue her from. Right. So she haunts the family. And then she like, throughout the movie, she befriends the youngest daughter. And they team up and they kill everybody else in the family except for the mom. And at the end, because no one else can see the ghost daughter but... The younger daughter, mm-hmm. they think the younger daughter is the culprit, and then they like they take her away, and it's like a whole scene where she's like in an asylum, and she's got the straight jacket on, which for some reason is hilarious. And then at the end of the movie, like everyone's dead, Valerie Hopper is the only one alive except for the crazy daughter. She's in the bed, and uh, she gets a knock at the door, and then she's got a home health care worker now, mm-hmm. and she's like, "Hey," and she's like, uh, "Do you need anything else, Miss?" Whatever her last name was. And she goes, no, 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 I'm good for the night. Have a good night. So she leaves. <laughs> and then there's another knock. And she goes, yes? No, no answer. Three mm. more knocks. I'm good for the night. No answer. Third knock. She looks at the edge of her bed from where she's sleeping. She looks at the edge of the bed. And the ghost of her daughter finally appears to her and comes up off the end of the bed and said, uh, hi, mommy. <laughs> and then she lets out a blood curdling scream. And that's the end of the movie. And I watched that when I was nine years old and I wasn't ready. And when that movie went off, my mom was like, all right, lights out. And I was like, no, this we can't do. <laughs> we can't do lights out right now. I need to wash this down with some cartoons or something. We got to do something about this. I can't just go to bed off on this. I didn't want to, I, I didn't want, uh, at that point, if you ask me, and I, I, if I ever ran for president, I would outlaw the ends of beds. Like, there's no more ends of beds. <laughs> I don't want any more ends of beds. I'm done with it. Oh, you've got that movie. You've got uh, uh, Poltergeist, which is the one that got a lot of kids. Poltergeist. From my era. The Clown. The, you have the, the clown, clown and the, clown. the chair at the, yeah. and, and then under the bed. That was probably the creepiest part of that movie. And then the tree in the window. There were a few things that got me about that. The tree in the window was always scary because you know a lot of kids have the tree. I had the tree in the window. Uh, I didn't have I didn't have a tree in the window, but I do understand what it's like because my cousin lived across the street from us, and his bedroom was like his bedroom window was facing his backyard, mm-hmm. and at night you couldn't see anything. Like his his yard was so dark, they didn't have any lights on back there, and he used to tell me that. At night, a tiger would like roam his backyard. Mm-hmm. Would never appear during the day, and I'm I'm so stupid. I believed it. I was like, "What?" He's like, "I'm serious." And I would look at the window, and I'd be so freaked out by that window. And I'd look in, and if I looked too close, he'd make a noise, and I think the, I thought the tiger was coming. Mm-hmm. You know, imagination. My imagination was was a gift and a as a gift and a curse because it makes. It makes me over analyze everything. Like I think things are happening that aren't because my imagination is out of control. It's the anxiety closet from uh, yeah. from Bloom County. <laughs> when you, but when I was, I don't know how universal an experience this is. When I was a kid, uh, and when those lights went off at night, usually I'd keep the door open. I didn't usually sleep with the with the door shut. There were there were the darkened corners and mm-hmm. there was the window and anything. Could Do you have a come, nightlight? Uh, not uh, not later on. Earlier on, I I would, but 
usually the, there would be light coming in from the from the open door and that was but i could imagine just about anything coming okay. from that the corner of that that dark corner of the room was a seam into another world for me the window anything could come could come from there anything from the outside world could come up could come at that point and nobody was looking so you know i had the trees there anything could come out of the woods because that was there there were trees outside my window <clears throat> in a forest that went for several acres yeah around the house and i could still the trees are grown up now so you don't you can't see the sky they moved out now so, well the, <laughs> they moved, moved. Uh, but when i was a kid you could still see some skyline and any yeah. light in there was of course an alien uh, you know, depending on what if i'd seen close encounters scared the crap out of me when i was a of kid of course uh, a lot of movies that weren't horror movies scared me when I was a kid. I'm thinking about that door and the cracked open, and my mind would immediately be like, "What if that door just slammed shut? <laughs> right, if it just right. slammed shut. I know I'm, I'm, I'm fucked. Like I would think about that all night. It wasn't even always something scary. Like I, we, you know, I went to a lot of funerals as a kid. We had a, a kind of an older family, and sometimes you would think, well, you know, is you know, but uh, that that uncle the, that whose funeral I went to two weeks ago, you know, is he gonna? I know that that uh, ghosts come out of the dark. What if it's a ghost of somebody that I know and like? You know, what if somebody <laughs> that's gonna come out of? You know, if my, well, you know, there'd be the fear of uh, what if a ghost comes out of there? But well, but what if it's Uncle Rock? That'd be awesome. That'd be cool. <laughs> you know, that's that'd be. I'd love to to hang out with hey, the, kids. With, with the ghost of my uncle Rock. He was a great guy. But your imagination takes over, and oh, and it was hard for me to get to sleep a lot when I was a kid. Well, my room when I was a kid, the way my bed was, my front door, my my parents would leave the. I would have the door open, all the way. Mm -hmm. The I lived in an apartment, and so the front door of our apartment, you could just see. Right out my out of my room, it was mm -hmm. right there, and it was a wood door, wooden door, uh, like an oak with the sort of wavy you know all that and with this brain of mine <laughs> i there was a person in that door mm -hmm. i know exactly where that person was and that person would stare at me every night until i couldn't handle it anymore in my mind that person was coming to get me eventually when i when i fell asleep i was done so every morning i'd wake up like huh Somehow I beat the odds to the point uh, where I told my parents about it. And I'm thinking back on it, they had to be exhausted with my bullshit. <laughs> because I remember my, my parents, like, I would tell them about it all the time. And finally, like, fine. We'll just, I don't know. You hear them arguing about it. I don't know what the fuck is wrong with them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to do something. I mean, we're going to do something. I'd be in the room like, don't believe in me, right? And so I, my dad was like, we're going to cover it up, all right? We're going to cover it up. And and I'd be like, all right, yeah, cover up the – um." and the person was called – it was Applehead. That's what I – That's the name you made up the for night, the – Because I had a nightmare the... about it. That's where I – okay, this is the – I had a nightmare one night. It was a woman who had an Applehead. Who was coming to get me? And so just named, just called Applehead. And I woke up and I just happened to look. I was facing the door. Mm -hmm. And I, I could see in the the grooves of the wood something staring back at me. So mm -hmm. I just connected the two. And to me, that was a plot. Okay. They were, something was coming to get me. Mm -hmm. And so there was like a, a couple of weeks where I was telling my parents about it and those arguments would happen where they like, <laughs> the boy's crazy, you know, and he'd hear that stuff. And then finally they were like, well, just cover up the door. I was like, get rid of the door. That was my solution. Just get rid of the fucking door. My parents were like, I will just cover it up. So my dad took a piece of paper and to cover it up. And he would, he was like, I'm going to cover it up. And he mm. put the paper on. And of course I'm like, no, not there. That, you don't see her. <laughs> she's there and my dad's just he's nine you know like just dealing uh -huh. with me till finally I was satisfied where they put the paper and even then I was still worried that I was gonna wake up one day and the paper was gonna be gone like there's no stopping me 
<laughs> but I think I don't. That never happened. Although, if I were my parents, I'd have taken the paper yeah, down you, to see, just to you, freak me out. You need to write that story. I think you need to write that as a short story or something, or as a screenplay. You need to. Apple okay. Head needs to exist. Yeah, that's that's one of those memories that has never gone away. Apple I had Head. a similar thing where one night I thought for sure. I heard like a, a a slapping noise on my window, and I turned to to look, and there was a face in the window. Phillips that, lock. That's what. Well, it, to me, I don't know. It looked like so, some sort of alien face. It, was, it had eyes and a nose and a mouth, yeah. but it were all sort of askew a and arranged, and it was too wide and too. And, and it, it was. Uh, I'm sure it was a nightmare that seemed real to me the next day, but it, I can still picture the face it was like somebody it was it was like uh leatherface in a ski mask did you investigate there, there was nothing out there when i when i so you did I, get up I, I, I didn't know i didn't get up i i was really young at that point and and i was scared shitless i remember uh what i did in the t- in, either in the dream or i made it up in my imagination while i was awake but I remember trying to yell for my, trying to call to my mom. But I was too, I was so scared that if I <laughs> yelled, it would startle it. Right. So I was sitting there with my, with like my covers up around my chin, going. Mom, was it looking at you? Mom. Was it looking at you? It was four feet from me. I uh, had it was in the window because I, you know, my my bed was just a few feet from from the window. So you just kind of like made peace. I just sort of well, I stared at it and I was calling my mom like whispering. Mom. Yeah. Mom, mom, and I don't remember how that how it ended. So it wasn't like it didn't like go it, away. It had to have been a it had to have been a nightmare. It couldn't have been something that that I created in my my waking like, imagination. Wrong house, my bad. And then he left. Yeah, because there was <laughs> there, there, there wasn't a button on that. There wasn't a point where we're like, well, this is awkward. Uh, are you gonna kill me? Nope, just looking. You know, are you so. I don't. It, it didn't. There's no ending. Uh, just the pop up staring contest. Yeah, it's a pop up staring contest. Which you know, who the hell knows if I, if if there had been a house anywhere near, or it could have been, you know, my my sister was older. Who knows? Maybe it was one of her friends that just threw. Because I I scared my sister in that way sometimes too. I had an old man mask, and every once in a while, I I, I did that to her once or twice. So maybe it's a, a family secret that nobody's told me about that 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 uh, she got revenge on me for for. Uh, for doing that, for like putting the old man mask. So she just you know, went outside. Oh. Yeah, so maybe maybe this was something that that actually did happen, and, oh. and all these years, I, I'm not sure I've ever mentioned it to to my parents or my sister that I that I saw this, because uh, it, it seemed crazy to me even then. So maybe there's a. Maybe there's a. I want to investigate. The, uh, I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you meddling kids' answer to, to this thing that. But it still spooks me. I wrote about. Uh, I wrote. I wrote it into a short story once. Actually, then it's a very vivid memory uh, for me. And I don't remember dreams or nightmares usually. Yeah, they, well, they usually disappear. But there are some that you like. The Applehead thing will never go away. Mm-hmm. That's in my head forever. Applehead was pushing a, a baby carriage too. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if there was a baby in there. I, all mm-hmm. I know is she's pushing it ahead, but looking at me like. I'm coming back. It was like I'm coming back for you. Was the vibe? There was like, when when there were a couple of movies I remember that that scared me when I was a kid. Some that I don't. A lot of horror movies don't necessarily scare me. <clears throat> they will give me unsettling visions, which is probably better. Something you know, uh, something you were, wicked this way comes is that way. Well, you were talking about Poltergeist. Yeah, and and the parts that like the clown part scared me the most. The part that didn't really scare me was. Uh, when Carol Ann was stuck in the television set. Yeah. That part didn't do... I was, as a kid, I was like, pick it to hang. You can hang out with Tom and Jerry. Like, she got to <laughs> hang out with Bugs Bunny and everybody. Like, that's the... I wish I could have been in the television set. Well, the, 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 the other couple of parts of that that were creepy was the, uh, the, the, the maggot meat was disgusting. Yeah. That got a reaction. Well. And the guy uh, uh, tearing into his face in the mirror in the bathroom. When his face started turning into rotting meat, that was that was scary. But something like uh, something wicked this way comes. There wasn't a jump scare. Do you remember seeing that? Uh, have you seen the the Disney something wicked? Uh, this way comes? I think I saw it as a kid. I don't. It's been. I don't remember it. 
Well, the idea is that the the autumn people come to town and, and the circus comes to town, basically. Yeah. And the circus is really run by this sort of demon or devil and he try he offers everybody what they what they want you know there's one guy who was who's had a had a football career until his leg was amputated and he sort of dangles you know what would you would like to you to have that leg back no. and the only of course the only people it's based on a the Ray Bradbury uh, book the only people in town who sort of see this for what it is are these two young kids uh, and there's kind of an Atticus Finch uh, uh, quality to it because the the only the, there's a Jason Robards character who's the the, uh, the older father or one of the kids who seems like you know he's a little older than everybody else's father maybe he can't do anything and it's sort of up to the kids and then him mm-hmm. <clears throat> to stop the uh the autumn people and it's jonathan price as the uh the ringleader there were some really scary things in that but they were more things that planted seeds that scared me later there wasn't anything that made me jump back in horror in the movie but there were things that stuck in my head anytime a carnival comes to town now you're thinking mm. you know what what could be <clears throat> what could what's staying yeah. what's coming with it yeah that's how that's how <laughs> i was with uh the blair witch project mm-hmm. nothing in the movie made me the the scariest part of that movie to me was the very last scene as far as you know when mm-hmm. the, the guy standing just standing there but it was afterwards kind of going about my day and being alone at certain points and then that imagination thing comes into play mm-hmm. you hear a noise here and there and you start thinking about it that's what got me with a movie like that then there were uh there was time bandits mm. which scared me a lot as really a kid. That scared well because that movie it was a it was an adventure movie through a lot of it but at the very beginning you've got these kids that because go back to to the things coming through the seams and the, right. the I was that kid and time bandits you know the the uh, uh, the the time bandits actually come through uh, Kevin's closet they come through that door and then. God's head appears and chases them down a hall that's created <laughs> when you push part of that wall away. So there's the idea that your walls aren't really your walls. There's 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 a malleable aspect to them. <clears throat> the idea that you could push on your wall and it would push all the way into some other dimension and you wind up in ancient Rome hanging out with Agamemnon. Incredible adventure, also incredibly that that image of God's head. I like how when you go when you <laughs> hang out in ancient Rome, you just start at the top. Yeah. You don't just hang out with a regular old villager. Nah, Agamemnon, what's up, baby? Well, that that's what it was in Time Bandits. That's what that's what he found. It was an incredible. What's good, Agamemnon? <laughs> that that's what it was in Time Bandits. That's who he. I know, he, but he it's, just, yeah, it's just yeah, it's just still funny. But it, uh, but that image of God. Do you remember that the, the 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 that blue head chasing them down the corridor? I mean, I can see how that freaks somebody out. There was that. Then there was also the idea that. They finally confront the devil, and they're in that 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 the that version of hell w- was really scary to me. <clears throat> but then, my you know, as a kid, you've got that idea, that pro wrestling idea of the good guys come in and it sort of beat the crap out of the bad guys. They're facing basically Satan, and <clears throat> all of the time bandits have gone back through history to get the greatest heroes. It comes with cowboys, it comes with Roman centurions, it comes with with archers, it comes with like, and all the of the cavalry with with, it, with a tank, literally cavalry, yeah, 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 yeah uh, cavalry, and they all come and surround you like, yeah, you you got that moment like, yeah, you're going down, you're going down, and then every hero in history, one by one, is killed in a horrible manner, and Satan hasn't has barely lifted a finger. Yeah, you're like, the bad guys are gonna win. How do the the bad and then randomly God shows up, punishes Satan, and that and that's it. It's random. The say the being saved is random, and God doesn't care about having saved you. He's just mad at his employees he for stealing a map. The devil shit. And there was that, and then at the very end of that, there's Kevin's house burns down. And sorry, spoiler, you should have watched the movie by now. In that toaster <laughs> oven. Is is a is in the in the remains of the fire, is one bit of pure evil, and Kevin's parents touch that 
and explode. And as he's trying to process the, par- the, the, the idea that his house just burned down and his parents just explode, the camera pulls out and shows you the universe and you're that small in the universe and that insignificant. Have a nice time, folks. Good night. That's the end of the movie. Mm. That scared the crap out of me. Yeah, yeah. That No, I got it. I, I understand that. Sort of the... Um, uh, the idea that you're not in control of anything, because control is what we want, right? Yeah. We want control. You're not in control of anything. This isn't the same thing, but when I was in sixth grade, for some reason, my English teacher was talking to us about death. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, he, uh, you know what? I think it was. I think some kid. I think it was like a murder or something that happened, and it was like a big story. <laughs> And the not in your class, right? No, no, not in my <laughs> class. We, no, nobody we knew. And they were talking about it to us. And sort of like, you kids want to learn? And so my teacher, Mr. Uh, Mr. Goldman, he was talking to us about that stuff. And he kept bringing up the idea of time. You know, when your time is up, that's really not much you could do about it. Uh-huh. And I think I was the only kid in class who was like, no oh, man, this is bullshit. I won't be here anymore. And it really freaked me out because it was him explaining to me that I don't really control the things that I wish I could control. At an age where, you know, as a kid, you think you're a superhero. You don't think nothing right. can stop you. And so you're telling me at 11 that my t- like time's going to get me. And once the other kids knew that that freaked me out, they were all like, Lamont, time. <laughs> time is coming and i'd be like leave me alone i'd run out. oh man i was such a punk well i think there were there was a point around 10 11 12 where the scary things start to become less about the boogeyman and more about the concepts that you're just realizing are real in your life like time or, or death yeah and and if anything that makes you face that is, is scary so i think those monsters take on a different a different meaning I'd also say the boogeyman uh, still scares me. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the boogeyman, by the way. Yeah. Don't want no problems, boogeyman. If you're listening, we're we're yeah. fine with you. Yeah, I'm uh, cool. Your, your closet business has never been stronger. Yes, we'll leave some cookies in there for yeah. you. Whatever you need, just just uh, uh, don't don't. The book speaking of Ghostbusters cartoon, the boogeyman that they had in that cartoon. It was like they. It was like they animated my nightmares. Mm-hmm. Have you? Do you, are you? You know what I'm talking about? That, I, I don't think I've seen it. I don't think I've seen that, or I don't remember it. I used to watch it when I was a kid. Creepiest but... boogeyman I've ever seen. I mean, they say Michael Myers is the boogeyman. But Michael Myers is Michael Myers. This boogeyman lived in your closet, and it was almost like what you were saying about how the walls lead to other dimensions. Yeah. And the same. That's what I was thinking. Like the closets, your closet, to you. You see your clothes and whatever else you have in there. But at a certain point in the night, it becomes a gateway into some dark universe where the boogeyman comes from. And that idea always freaked me out. Anything that's the unknown. And the unknown is what's, you know, it can be what's behind that door. And Mm -hmm. I don't know why necessarily the darkness makes that scarier because it's not, you know, it's the same amount of dark inside that closet during the day as it is during the night. Well, when it's dark and it's night and everything's dark, then all you really have is your imagination. Yeah. If you can't see anything, then you have your imagination. That's why you have a nightlight. Mm. I had an Oscar the Grouch nightlight Uh. and I plugged that motherfucker in every night. (laughs) So let's, let's go through some of the, uh, some of the, the classic, monsters i didn't make an actual list for this but let's start with ghosts do you find ghosts scary um i find that they can be Mm -hmm. um i can't think of a specific ghost that freaks me out i mean obviously poltergeist we talked about but the ghost on its own without sort of like the ghosts in poltergeist used other things to Mm -hmm. help scare uh, people, yeah, because well, cause pol- poltergeist is a very p- particular kind of spirit. It's more yeah. malevolent spirit than a than a ghost. But like a ghost just chilling. A ghost can be kind of anything. I just uh, the the last episode of the podcast, I I, I spoke 
uh, with Lisa Kroger and Melanie R. Anderson of a, a wonderful book called Monster, she wrote, and they talked about the gothic tradition of ghosts and how ghosts, when you first start to see them appear in sort of English literature, frequently they're just there to, to tell their relatives where the loot's hidden. You know, that's that's how they function. Is that what it is? It's sort of, you know, they're just coming back to say, somebody's cheating you, look closer <laughs> at the wheel, and then later on... Let me help become... you find this money right quick. Yeah. That, that's that a, a, I like that ghost. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good ghost. And then the, 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 what it meant to be a ghost sort of changes through, I never, through literature. I've never been introduced to that ghost. I usually get the ghosts that have unfinished business. Well, that's like not, yeah, well, the, they're unfinished business. Well, is, they're on, but I mean, they're on, you know. Is I mean, somebody like, has yeah. tried to pervert my will and this is how I, I you know, that's that's more, I guess, 19th century uh, ghosts and they get scarier and, and scarier as it, it goes on and people have more stomach for, more stomach to be scared by their, their literature. And then that, that, um, that, increases when the the movie era comes up and you're trying to show ghosts on screen i just did uh i'm doing the daily horror film festival on the the blog right now and one of the the uh i'm doing classic films on on sundays this past one was uh was it called it was just called the haunted house it's a, a silent french film oh i'm forgetting what year it was but it's believed to be the first uh the first representation of ghosts in cinema and it's almost a comedy the way they do it because it's these hapless people in a haunted house and the ghosts are, are are messing with them so some people consider it i think it's an interesting point some people consider it comedy and some people consider it a, a horror movie i have to see it because <clears throat> the ghosts are just messing pulling chairs out from people and and slicing like their cake imp- in front of impish, them kind of like yeah very impish so some kids died, apparently. <laughs> it he, he, like. he, yeah, they can they can be anywhere from that to to you know uh, attacking you and uh, or or they can be like the others, uh, the the Nicole Kidman movie, yeah. where you don't realize. Okay, again, spoiler: you should have watched a movie. You know that one's twenty years old. You know that that you don't realize you're following the ghosts instead of the the people. Doesn't that sort of, in a way, make um, uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost kind of creepy when you realize that he's probably just a kid who died? Yeah. And he's coping with it? Yeah. Maybe he doesn't even know? Uh huh. Well, that that's what Mama was too. The movie Mama, which I which I liked quite a lot, which a lot of, a lot of people didn't like. Yeah. So I like the. How do you do something new with the idea of of a malevolent spirit returning? You know, y- you look at it at what why it's returning and and w- how you can ease its pain to make it move on you know and that that's i like the those sort of ideas when you realize there's a way i can deal with this that's not like i'm going to be the valiant warrior who vanquishes the ghost oh, no you're not you don't you're human but you have something you can do about it you the only way to get rid of a ghost is to give it what it wants Get a, yeah to give it whatever. There's no way to. This, I mean, unless you you know, unless you know the Ghostbusters, in which case. Uh-huh. But then you got a whole other thing, really, where it's like these guys are kind of like political prisoners. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> like well, they are, just, yeah, it can be anything. Well, I, almost, almost any horror concept is malleable in that way. We we can let's move on to zombies now. People uh, use zombies uh, yeah. f- uh, to to tell political stories or to tell social stories or just to tell a story. George Romero, where you're getting your your head chewed off, and a- any version of that is fine with me as long as you do it well. I love zombie movies. I love them. Uh, the messages great. Uh, I my favorite part of any zombie movie. It is uh, what I like to call the calm before the storm. So, like, when it's happening, when it's starting to happen, and not everyone knows that it's happening, Uh like, you might see something and you just brush it off as, oh, okay. But something Mm. just happened. Right. But it's not, like, we're maybe an hour away from all hell breaking loose. But that moment of, huh, who 
simple as that. Right. Shaun of the Dead did that better than any yeah. movie for, for my Man. my money. When they're what singing white movie. lines, a, a drunk walking out of the pub. and The couple the, starts like what they think are making out. It's a, oh wait, what were the kids, what were the ones that they thought were making out? It, they This is when they left the bar drunk and there was a couple and it looked like they were making out. And then once they, so what you saw, what they saw was two people making out. What we saw was one person eating another person. I gotta go. I don't remember that. I just remember the guy singing the the call and response for White Lion when they were going like, oh, singing for, like, <laughs> like, and they think he's just singing with them when they yeah. when they walk by, or the the one of the best bits when he slips on the blood at the convenience store and uh, and just doesn't realize that's what he just slipped on and goes to try to pay for his stuff in the morning and he's not seeing. Yeah. <laughs> what's the message there though? there's a message there right like the guy he's just kind of going through his life he's kind of got sort of a so-so job he doesn't really he's not really happy with his life and it's so consuming that he doesn't recognize the world around him it's a solipsism of it yeah. it's it, it's the idea that you're fo- so focused on your own world that you're not looking at the world around you which is of course the reason why he's at a dead-end job and the reason why his girlfriend's leaving yeah. him the reason why he has to find something heroic in himself to it's one of my favorite movies of all time i love it I it love is that. a it's, great movie it's what one of those movies me. where i could watch it every day it's what started me uh, on a trajectory uh that and reading the walking dead comics or what sort of started me on a, a trajectory of becoming a huge horror fan again like I, I loved it when i was a kid i didn't know what to name it really i liked creepy things I liked watching Return of the Living Dead. That's my favorite. That's my favorite zombie flick. No disrespect to George Romero. Mm-hmm. Although I did, I did hear that they wrote that movie originally to be to present to Romero. Like here's a sequel, mm-hmm. but then I think Day of the Dead came out before they could do that. Mm-hmm. Something like that, and so they decided to make it slightly campier and an homage. Right. To George Romero, and it worked uh, that 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 yeah. that punk stuff. Loved it. The uh, the idea. I grew up in in a, a rural area. Perhaps I've mentioned that twenty or thirty times. I, I'm sorry if I've mentioned it too much. Mm. But the idea, when I was a kid, the idea of the punk rock scared me because <laughs> I didn't. It was this other thing. It was like, oh, what are the? Because every representation you saw of it in the media were these mean, nasty people who were shooting up and want to and and w- would kill you for for drug money so that so you know the punk stuff in in return of, of the living dead was scary to me and that carried over to an, another movie which i consider a horror movie surf nazis must die i mean it kind, that's a trauma flick right yeah it's a trauma flick it's, so it's, it's kind another... of a horror movie i mean trauma sort of dabbled in the mixture mm-hmm. of comedy and horror because I, I consider yeah. Toxic Adventure kind of a horror movie. Yeah. It's horrific what happened to him, right? Yeah. But anyway, Surf Nazis. Yeah, that that scared me as well because I was, you know, to me, <laughs> you know, for in my in my young mind, uh, I, I hopefully I was, disillu- I was uh, disabused of the notion quickly after. But, you know, to me, that that looked like something that was probably going on somewhere in California. And I didn't want to go to California now because <laughs> I saw... If this is if that's what's going on in California, it's not. But if that's what's going on in California, I don't ever want to go there. These people are, these people are scary. What is your? Do you have a favorite zombie flick? Uh, is it cheating to say Shaun of the Dead? It's a. It's How's a, it cheating? Uh, some because it's a. It's equal parts comedy and horror. But it's a zombie flick, and they do both so well. I don't care if it was a drama movie. If it was drama. It's a zombie. There's zombies yeah. in the movie. <laughs> it's my favorite. I love the the Romero films, and, and you know the original Romero film didn't scare me as much. The original Night of the Living Dead when I first saw it, but I I love it having seen it more. The, when you watch the original Night again, it is really you know it's so much. What's great about a zombie movie when it's great are the times when nothing's happening. Yeah, because again you're like. All right, where are the zombies? You want to know because the fear is the unknown, right? Yeah. Well, there's another one that I love. Uh, I've got it up there on the shelf called It's a micro-budget English film called Colin. What's it called? Colin. 
and it's shot from they i was uh it was something like it cost 20 bucks to make literally and that's partly because of the guy who made it i guess could call in some favors from some special effects buddies so he didn't have to pay for everything but it's a movie from the uh from the zombies point of view and sound in a zombie movie is so important to me and there's one scene in colin where since it's from the zombie's point of view, the literal uh, eye view of Colin the zombie, he walks into a house where there's a zombie siege happening. And because he's a zombie, he's not focusing where you think he should focus. So his his eyes are swerving back and forth and they'll swerve he, as he as his gaze passes the stairs. You see that there are humans, you know, people trying to fight off these zombies that are coming up the stairs like this is the end stage of a of a zombie home invasion and there you could see they're losing and you can hear them screaming there's a woman on the on the steps screaming and there's somebody up, else upstairs you know that you could tell is human screaming we got you know we got to get out of here we got to do this and and but then they they his vision swerves again and they're out of view but you still hear them mm. and you still hear all the zombies who are in the room from the uh a sort of stereo position in the sound mix of where he is Mm -hmm. so it's just this constant moaning all around him and you see another part of what's scary about that is not all the zombies are focused on the people just the ones that they happen to you know just a few on the stairs and then some others sort of notice so it's the other zombies are just sort of there in the room and they they all sort of slowly notice the people so it's not an immediate throng and they're they're torn apart. There's no sense of smell with a zombie, right? Probably not. That's a It's a focus thing, right? You look and you see and you or you hear. And the, then they then they because a lot of zombie flicks has zombies wandering around and it's once they hear or see you that they come. Well, they play with that. The Walking Dead uh likes to play they, with that because they have uh the you know, guts. The, yeah, the in season one where everybody covered themselves with the guts to mask their smell to walk through the zombies and the current season, the Whisperers who do that. Although the Whisperers seem to, their uh, their skins seem to get old after a while. They have shown them getting, sort of making new ones. And it seems to me like that smell wouldn't, wouldn't mask you for very long. Well, the, it's Beta, Beta's mask, did you watch this past week? Yeah. So his his uh, spoiler alert, yes. his mask is like his best friend, and he's yeah. never changed his mask. I guess that's one of those things where you're just supposed to go, well, whatever. Yeah, but there's a lot of that in zombie films, yeah. and we, we've been watching uh, Being Human, the the original English series, which is, uh, uh, it almost sounds like a, a bad joke, a, a ghost, a vampire, and a werewolf having to live in the same flat, uh, and it's a. There's some great horror parts of it, and there is some, and, and it's it, it's set up. It's a very clever show, but you get to see sort of they play with the rules. Like you know, a vampire can go outside now. A vampire might not have super strength. Every iteration of a vampire or a zombie or a werewolf or a ghost, you've got to kind of make it your own and establish which of the rules you're going to follow and which which of them you're not. Yeah, most most zombie flicks follow the brains eating rule, but Walking Dead doesn't. They just eat you, yeah, your, your body. Which is more going back to the uh, the original Romero wasn't brains. Uh, yeah, he wasn't. They were just they tearing were just you apart, flesh eaters. Yeah. yeah, they were just and the well and the original. So the return re- did return usher the the brains thing in. Yeah, I think return was, that return? was, was the, the the big turning point for that. And before Romero, zombies were. Uh, um, like what was were, it? White zombie? Well, they were voodoo zombies. Voodoo zombie, they were right. Haitian zombies or uh, a mind control and voodoo, that kind of thing. So they weren't the undead. Romero made them the undead, or at least popular. So it. the voodoo stuff was it like uh, I could like body transference, like I could tra- like like Chucky. It was more like slaves. Okay. Uh, the that you were you were made a zombie. And controlled by by somebody else, okay. kind of that, and they. I think that there are references calling them the undead in there somewhere, but I think that the the idea of literal undead, uh, the the uh, dead rising from the graves. I 
that that definition of a zombie, I think, at least solidifies, if not starts with, with Romero's Night of the Living Dead. And that's another feather in the cap of Return of the Living Dead because with that punk soundtrack, it was like they put an exclamation point because they made the zombies coming out like a party. Yeah. Like it was like, oh, this, like it was almost like you want to rock with the zombies. Right. That, oh, that scene with, um, it starts with the skeleton coming up and mm-hmm. then it looks up and the mouth opens uh-huh. and then that song, do you want to party? Yeah. Shout out to 45 Grave, the name of the band. <laughs> uh, well, the one in the basement was the, the always a scary Oh, Tarman. One. Tarman. Tarman, yeah. yeah. He was the, he was definitely creepy. And I, he might have been the creepiest one because he didn't even know what was going on outside. He didn't know he had backup. He just knew he was in that basement by himself. Yeah, well, that's what a zombie is. Um, you know, they, they, they're not thinking. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a, there's a hive mind, but I don't think that, that that doesn't necessarily extend to self-preservation. Right. So, and he, he had a, he, they knocked his head off with a baseball bat. Uh, that was hilarious. Clue Gallagher. Yeah. Let's move on to vampires. Do vampires scare you? No. I wouldn't mind being one. Uh-huh. Vampires are sexy. Mm. You know, it just and I'd like like if a vampire is gonna kill me, I'm not gonna be scared before it kills me. Mm-hmm. Because I'm goofy by nature. Uh-huh. And the universal way we've been taught that vampires speak has <laughs> always been funny to me. Bella Lugosi, you know, blah, like that. <laughs> you talk like if somebody, I couldn't handle it. Like, blah, come here. I'd be like, you talk funny. Uh-huh. So I would be laughing all the way to my neck getting bitten. But then I get to live forever. But that, well, not always. Because sometimes they're just feeding. Sometimes they're not turning you. Is yeah, there, I like to think my personality would make them go, you know, we want to keep this one around. <laughs> It'd be cool. The scariest versions of a, a vampire to me, uh, 30 Days of Night, that was pretty, mm-hmm. that was actually, I liked that uh, version of a vampire, and that sort of follows the, uh, you know, there was the, the, the trend that Anne Rice kind of started with the, the more sensitive vampires. Let's consider what these people or what these, what what these creatures do. But yeah, because they have to live forever and they Somebody's have to see Somebody's going to have to go to work. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's that was thirty days of was, night, he, was she interview with the vampire? Was that yeah. her? Yeah, uh, yeah, in seventy five or seventy six. I don't, I don't, I don't think people. Sometimes people don't realize how early that stuff was in, the, when the books came out. But the other version that scared me was the Lost Boys. Love it. My favorite. That's my favorite. Mm. Yes, the Lost Boys. I I loved that because that's another. Well, you. That that I know you would like because there's a gang. No, that's my f- yeah, that's my favorite. You love the gang. vampire movie. I love any kind there's a crew. Yeah, getting involved with stuff. Um, I love that the the underlying that the, the the dog knows what's up. The whole movie, the uh-huh. dog knows what's up, and he's just like no one's listening to me, and the grandfather knows what's up the whole time and doesn't say shit until the end. <laughs> he doesn't say a thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's the one thing I hate about where were they, where they live saying something. Oh, the yeah, they lived on a, on a pier that could appear on it. Uh, yeah, was it Pacific Northwest or was it California? No, it was California. It was California. It was California. Uh, that I movie watch that again. I haven't seen it in so long. It's been it's been it's been forever. That movie. What was the other one? Near Dark. Oh yeah. Yeah, but but Lost Boys for me is, and that was definitely the first time for me where. I, I saw vampires that, you know what? They're not hilarious. Because they talk like, it's just regular speak. And that's, and that's also the first movie that taught me the rules mm-hmm. of vampires. As in, well, at least rules that I remember following. Mm-hmm. Um, well, following, but you know. Where, you know, a vampire can't enter your house unless invited. Like, stuff like that. And, um... If you had any real fears of vampires, at least you were now armed with this information. Right. Well, I mean, and plus, they were people in your neighborhood. And if you were yes. a kid watching it like I was, the, and, and they're hassling kids on a pier, everybody has had to deal with a bully. 
And what if your bully was a vampire? Yeah, there's no, there's was no, your we, was your crew of of friends up to that? No. So that let's uh, move on to the mummy. We another classic uh, horror not, villain. Not scared of the mummy. Not scared of the mummy. Yeah, we talked about this sort of. Bor- the, Boris Karloff's mummy. Not scared of him. He just looked like a dude who belonged to a lodge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the mummy is we we were discussing on the way up here about it. It feels like you you sort of have to. The mummy's not coming for you unless you've sort of done something to disturb the mummy. You you're, you're, there's very little chance that a mummy's going to come out of the dark in your closet at night if you're a kid. Now, if and maybe I need to watch these movies again in full and maybe see some stuff that I may have missed, but if there's a way they can relay that possibility, mm-hmm. then it might change the mummy for me. If they can relay that, so like the, what the Lost Boys did for vampires, mm-hmm. it modernized it. It made it in your neighborhood. It made it outside your door. Mm-hmm. The mummy... Eh. My favorite representation of a mummy in TV or film was the Amazing Stories episode where there's a guy playing a mummy in a, a filming a movie playing a mummy and his wife goes into labor and he's got to get to the hospital and he doesn't have time to take the makeup off. Mm-hmm. So he's uh, so he tries to get to the hospital to get to his wife and in the meantime meets up, meets up with a real mummy <laughs> who is... A, <laughs> it was such a, a wonderful thing. It's such a, a wonderfully convoluted... True to the amazing story's name, <clears throat> that's probably my my favorite. Did he mummy. have the mummy rap? <clears throat> he was rocking the mummy rap. He was rocking the mummy rap, and so was the the mummy that he met uh, on the way to the hospital. Um, I don't know that uh, the was it the '90s version or the early 2000s version of the mummy didn't really grab me. Maybe I have to watch those again. <laughs> oh, the the Brendan Fraser. Yeah. I, yeah. It was that move. Those movies were more action and adventure, mm-hmm. not horror. Mm-hmm. And they brought the rock in. So, nah. So, mummy does nothing for me. Has never done anything for me. And if, if the mummy showed up right now, I wouldn't be afraid of him. Mm-hmm. We could probably outrun him. I did like the original uh, Boris Karloff mummy movie, but it's more of a drama with horror elements uh, uh, to it. The, it's. It's uh, it's not an all-out horror movie the way that, that Dracula and Frankenstein were before it. Frank, well, <laughs> what about so? What, let's go to Frankenstein. What do you, what do you think of Frankenstein as a character? I I feel like I like Frankenstein, right? I do like him. I like him more than I like the Mummy. Um, but I also don't find him particularly scary. In that Frankenstein, you gotta catch me. Mm-hmm. If he catches me. And I'm finished, right? I can't. He's power. He's strong. I can't really. But he's just walking around. The mummy that I mean, the mummy, the the Frankenstein that we've kind of grown up with, that Frankie guy, you know, uh, doesn't really. I find him a bit, you know, like when he with the little girl in the in the water, uh-huh. and he. It's almost like he's he a doofus. Little girl. Yeah. Well, I mean, the whole point of him that that any horror movie that I mean, there's there are some movies that have been trying to remake sort of Frankenstein as a vampire or zombie like creature but the whole point of the original Frankenstein was that that he was a, a one-off individual I mean his his particular story is what you're supposed to be looking at well, the scariest he's, he's, the scariest thing about Frankenstein isn't the monster it's Dr. Frankenstein yeah because he, he's he's yeah. made this thing and this he's thing, this thing. The, the original Frankenstein just wanted to be loved and if he couldn't be loved he would be feared right so that so, so you you can't like the idea that I live in this town where I can wake up and I'm you know what what would he he would get the body parts from just he mm. was he was he robbing graves I can't remember yeah. okay so yeah that's the freaky stuff the monster itself mm-hmm. the scariest version of Frankenstein might be in Penny Dreadful I don't know if you watched that the Showtime no, series I seen it. where it was it was another one of these movies that sort of mashes up. A different sort of. By the way, I also tropes. think I also not to cut you off, but I also think a real reason that some of these classic movie monsters don't freak me out as much is because we've grown up with so many cartoonish versions of them. Yeah, and it's kind of it just takes all that edge off. Count Chocula, Frank, Count Chocula, Frank, 
if I was around in the 30s, one, I'd probably hate it because I'm black. But two, <laughs> but two. There's that. You'd yeah, have your that own would be a bad scene. On. I wouldn't even be able to go to the movies. Have the, which movie can I go to? Yeah, well, if uh, Frankenstein played banjo back then, he might. Oh, be. if he had a banjo? <laughs> I'd be I'd, I'd be running like they do in Scooby Doo, where they jump and then they run in place for five seconds. But Frankenstein, even the way that was shot, we wouldn't necessarily look back at it now and think it's 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 uh, it's scary. But it was influenced by German expressionism, uh, and there were uh, weird angles. There were all of those uh, those wonderful set pieces. I keep forgetting who designed those. The the all the zapping. Uh, um, uh, what do they call them? The um, they've got one at the Museum of Science, the Van der Graaff generators. All of that electricity zapping from yeah. the, for, from everywhere. You know that would that was that was high scale stuff. But back then, that was something you would look at and marvel. How did they do that back then? But let's go on. You know, but in Penny Dreadful, just to to make that point, <clears throat> it's more. You know, Frankenstein is trying to fit into society. Nobody looks at him necessarily. I mean, people think he's horrific, but people don't say, "Oh, a monster." They don't. They don't chase him through the streets. He's just shunned to the point where he's trying to get back to to his <laughs> his maker and kill him and make his life a living hell. And he talks and he interacts with with society, and he looks more like the Edison Frankenstein from the uh, the 1910. Uh, like the Edison Mary Shelley, movie. the the original sort of idea of him. Well, the the yeah, he looks a, a little more like m- what Mary Shelley would have, uh, I think, probably would have envisioned Frankenstein to look like, just a sort of mangled human. Mm. So let's let's move on to werewolves. Yeah, what do you think talking. of werewolves? Now we're talking. <clears throat> werewolves are freaky because you can't talk to them. <laughs> right. Werewolves are. I mean, it's a it's a it's a damn animal. Like, it's a person that you know in the daytime who at night, when the moon is right, mm-hmm. will turn into this creature that you can't reason with. That's freaky. That's creepy. That's Michael Myers in a way. Mm-hmm. Although Michael Myers is a little different because he's quiet. But that's what freaks me out. And at the same time, that's what attracts me to, I've got this weird obsession with wanting, I've had it since I was like nine or 10 I've wanted to like, come on, let me just turn just once <laughs> to a werewolf. I think will be cool. And somebody was like, "Well, what do you do when you're the werewolf?" I'm like, "That's up to the werewolf." I'm once I turn, it's not up to me anymore. Mm-hmm. My job now is when I come back to be confused. Oh, mm-hmm. what? What happened? I don't know what the modern idea of a werewolf to me would be. I don't know that there has been a genre defining movie or tv show for werewolves in the past 10 or 20 years for me it was american werewolf in london that's a great one and that one that's a great one was great because anytime you can mix that that was like Shaun of the dead for me if you can mix horror and comedy in equal measure and do both right because that was a funny movie and a terrifying movie silver one. bullet mm-hmm. that one that's my favorite stephen king mm-hmm that one, it's Gary Busey in the Gary Busey is the drunk uncle, and then Corey uh, Haim, who's also in Lost Boys. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's there it is. There's your neighborhood werewolf. Right. right. The werewolf is the guy who lives down the street, but you don't know it, and people just keep disappearing. Mm-hmm. And how do you figure it out? And this one kid, this fearless kid who just goes out when, at a time where the werewolf operates because no one's out. So mm-hmm. no one's going to identify him, but he sees the werewolf. Mm-hmm. And now he's almost like, it's almost like he saw a mob hit uh-huh. that he was, as I wasn't, I didn't look on purpose. And now the werewolf is like going to get him, but he doesn't know when, he doesn't know how, and he mm-hmm. doesn't know who to look for because he doesn't know who it is. Like that scene when he sends his sister out because he shot him in the eye with like a, he had a, uh, crazy Uncle Gary Busey gave him uh, these fireworks, and he shot one of the fireworks mm-hmm. through the eye. I wonder if Gary knew he was in a movie. No, nah, no way. <laughs> like, I don't think he knows he's in Hollywood. He was just improvising all this yeah. dialogue there. He really thought there was. They just told him there was a werewolf. I was a lethal weapon. Threw him in with some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> threw him in with some kids. Yeah, that's a that's your first found footage movie. Oh, which could bring us to to Bigfoot. What was the uh, 
What was the original Bigfoot movie that set off the craze? Uh, there was a big. There was an original yeah, like Bigfoot it, it was movie. A, uh, like uh, Boggy. Was it Incident at Boggy Creek? I'm forgetting the name of it. This is the thing. I tr- this is the episode where I where I try to where I'm trying to do it with no notes. Usually, I write all this stuff down beforehand. But it was a. It was, I didn't know there was a. <laughs> I always thought that the Bigfoot lore was just something that was sort of created over time like Loch Ness Monster or it was but there was a movie that sort of uh, um, started the uh, craze of it and in the uh, Pacific Northwest it was a a, kind of the first found footage movie it was kind of the Blair Witch of a time but it was made uh, it was very schlocky uh, it it would look. It doesn't it doesn't hold up terribly well, uh, today. Because I can't think of a lot of mm. Bigfoot movies. Yeah, you know, there's not a ton. Uh, Bobcat Goldthwait made a a great one. Did he? Uh, the that uh, uh, that was also a found footage, sort sort of movie. And uh, it was that, played like it was a, it was played for horror. Yeah, it was, it was played for horror. He was it was. Uh, so that one was great. I wish I could remember the the name of the original. It was on the the uh, the last drive in this past season with Joe Bob Briggs. So you can he who he does a great job of filling you in on the the history of that one. So what's what haven't we talked about? We haven't uh, gone to aliens, scary aliens. Did that uh, get you? Aliens is one of those things where, again, once I see them, it's a wrap. Mm. So seeing a UFO would be like awesome for thirty seconds, mm-hmm. and then you start shaking hands with everybody and go, "Well, we had a good run," and that's uh, it. Like that's really all you can do, uh, depending on what they are, what they're like. You know, we all have our depictions of what aliens are. We always think aliens are brilliant. You know, right. and I was joking with a friend of mine a while back. I was like, "What if aliens like?" I think about like, do they have you know on, on their planet? Do they have like potholes? <laughs> they have like mundane things that they worry about, you know, and then when they come down here to they to take us over, then once they see like Breaking Bad, mm-hmm. what is, has anybody ever made a movie where, you know, you, you made me think there for a second, what are you about their reasoning for coming to Earth? We're yeah, always like, thinking about them conquering. What if they were just like, uh, the like the Pilgrims? It's uh, like yo, our planet is whack. What if their planet got invaded? By some other alien race, and they're coming here to be like, "Yo, y'all gotta help us out." Mm. Or yeah. what? What I was thinking, if they came here because they were persecuted on their own planet, <laughs> and, and and like the pilgrims here, and, oh. and tried to establish something new, and we'd be like the Native Americans. Oh man, has anybody made a film like that? I don't know that somebody must have. I can't have made that up just now. Maybe you did. What are we missing? What are the other? They're gonna kill us, though. They don't kill not me because I'm I'm ratting everybody out. We haven't talked about serial killers. Oh, you mean like the Jasons and the Freddies? Yeah, those would all sort of and uh, Michael kind Myers. Of the other some supernatural. Element now those them. those would be the creepiest of the bunch. Was supernatural or not? Doesn't... No, not supernatural. I mean, obviously in those movies, is the more they make, the more supernatural and cartoonish the characters mm-hmm. become. But in their initial, like the 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 original Halloween, 1978 Carpenter Halloween, or the Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, where Jason is the is, has the potato sack on, <laughs> um, which I he's the creepiest Jason. That's the creepiest Jason. He's still a human being. Mm-hmm. He does have a bit of a purpose though, because you know the idea is that he saw his mom killed in the original, and now he wants revenge, and he takes revenge out on anybody that looks like the people who that led. To, he he does kill the girl who killed his mom, mm-hmm. and then he goes back to camp, and he's like. All these people represent the people that killed my mom. And Friday the 13th, part two through part four, I read that, I looked up the timeline. They all take place in the span of four days. Mm -hmm. So Jason was busy. (laughs) Like two through four is a four day span. I might be, it might be three days. I think one of the things when they kept bringing him back, he kept coming back as a bigger and beefier kind of killer, out. and and that to me is less scary. 
Well, as it as it goes on, they be the movies get funnier, yeah, and they're goofier, and you start rooting for the killer. That, that's but that's why with, I specified. That's what happens with Freddy. Friday Thirteenth Two, or the original Halloween, right? Where they're just these unfeeling. You can't talk to them. There's no stopping them. Even if they understand what you're saying, they're not going to talk back to you. They have one thing in mind, right. and that is your death. That is it. And the, if you can somehow get away, cool. The idea that um, no matter how fast you run, it, it's the boogeyman. It's mm-hmm. the modern-day boogeyman. It's it's anybody you've ever known who might be quiet, who you might think, mm, I don't know about that person. That could be these guys. Well, then there are the the ones that I think are even scarier than that are the Hannibal Lecters, where you've been out thought on every angle, and now you're just prey. You know, okay. you're you're trapped in that you, you know, because Hannibal Lecter, there's a physicality to him, which you see sort of at the end of Silence of the Lambs, and and in, in, in even you know, in some of like the original Red Dragon or Manhunter, or especially in the books, but. His thing is by the time you know what he is, it's too it's late. It's too late. For for you. You're gone. You're gonna be sitting at the dinner dinner table with your brain exposed waiting for company. Yeah, being outsmarted by a Sarah Killer would definitely suck. So that that to me is almost scarier than 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 Michael Myers or, or Jason or that because you know <laughs> you know, for for, for Jason Go back to the city, you know. Drive away for Go for, back, for Texas right. Chainsaw Massacre, which is one of the, which I think is still one of the scariest movies. The original, yeah, ever, yeah. Because I went back. I've said this a few times. I think on this this podcast, I went back uh, a few years ago and watched that again, thinking, "Oh, this is going to look quaint." And I watched it at like two in the morning. I was the only one up in the house, and that I few of these movies legitimately scare me. Mostly it's that sort of unsettling feeling or there's a sort of th- thrill of the imagination right. of, of seeing the wonderful ways in which they show how fragile we are as human beings in some of the, these movies. But, that's well, but isn't that me. it, that though? But isn't me. that it, though? It's, it's, I get it. They have specific locales, right? Yeah. Camp Crystal Lake, Haddonfield, uh, wherever they are in Texas. But isn't that the idea? Like, you're not... The idea that they're not scary because you can just not go to these places. It's only prevalent or only makes sense if you are conscious of this idea. Right. But the world suggests that they're not conscious of it. We're just going to have a good time. So it's a part of your world. It's a part of your life. Right. It's the idea that these places exist somewhere and that you're not going to know when you're you, not going to know you when you encounter them. But with now some... with the sequels, you know, after like uh, five movies, you go, look, seriously. What the fuck? When you walk by that stop pile of dead bodies, just don't yeah. <laughs> stop going to the place with the pile of dead bodies. But with some, what I'm saying about Hannibal Lecter is you could be sitting next to him at, at the restaurant. Mm. You know, you could be, which is something I think you've mentioned uh, oh, has to be part of, 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 has to be present for it to scare you. It has to be something. Let me know if I'm getting this wrong. That, that it has to be something that that you could run across in your neighborhood. Something yes. that you could. That's what gets you the most. Wait, but your point is great because it enhances that. Yeah. Because not only is it somebody that you could just run across in your neighborhood, it's also someone you would never even think of, because Hannibal Lecter had a way where if you didn't know who he was and you saw him at a restaurant, he would. Oh, this guy's a little fancy. Yeah. And well, you he's, might he's even well to do. You might even be drawn to him because he's yeah, clever. He's, very he's charming. smart, and you get. You know, you know, he's a, hey, look at my new friend. Hey, why yeah. don't I have hands anymore? Why am I tied up he to this looks chair? Like the kind of, he looks like the kind of guy that would say, I'll have to have you to the house one day. And you <laughs> yeah. go, I would like to go to the house one day. And not knowing. So You'd brag about it. Hey, yeah, I made I'm going a, to the house. I made a fancy friend. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen uh, 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 Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon? I did see that. I know, I, I thought that was... A clever take well, I because it. there was different serial like competing serial killers in that at one point, right? Well, the the idea of the movie is that um it takes place in a world that suggests that Freddie, Jason, and Michael Myers all really exist. Right, right, right. And the guy in question, Leslie Vernon, is like a they're doing a documentary on him, and he's trying to become the next great name. They treat serial killing in that world like a profession, right? You know, so you do meet other serial killers, or at least another one in the movie. 
Uh, but you you meet his mentor, mm-hmm. you know, because there's like a scene where they go out, they they the, the person, uh, the people who are making the documentary go with Leslie to see his mentor, uh, who who was actually the actor who played um, he was in Walking Dead, he was um. Uh, he passed Which away recently. Character? Herschel. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Herschel. I can't Scott, uh, Scott Wilson. Scott Wilson. Yes, he was. He was the mentor, and uh, they they sit around to have like this discussion because the whole movie is about teaching you the rules, like how to how when you're running so fast and they're walking, do they catch you, or how when you thought he was dead, do they still come back? And they go through point by point. Or oh, how when you hear a noise over here and you go over here, they're right there. Mm-hmm. They go through every point, and when they meet the mentor, Scott Wilson, he has a great, he's like, you know, when I was coming up, because his, his time was like the <laughs> 60s, he would just kill someone, and that was it. We were gone. But nowadays, with the Freddies and the Michael Myers and the, these younger guys, they keep coming back, and I don't know how they're getting away with it. And it was like this, it was like, you're learning all the rules of a serial killer or mm-hmm. these movies, and you're also learning about the generation gap. There's like a generation gap or a generation war between the the types. Because right. while he's explaining, like in my day with serial killing, Leslie Vernon's kind of giving him the <laughs> old man, right? Like it's the, uh-huh. ch- the changing of the guard, and it's a very clever flick. It's on a uh, uh, Amazon Prime. If I'm it's not but mistaken. it's been bouncing around. It was I think it was on Shutter for a while, and it was on Netflix for a while, or it was on. I, I know I've I've seen it on more than one uh, service, so I'm not, I'm not sure. It might be on Amazon. I watched now. it a few months ago, unless they've okay, taken so, it down. They they could have because they do they switch stuff up and. Uh, but about three or four months ago, it was on Amazon Prime. Mm-hmm. You know, so a, a current TV show I re- would recommend if you if you've seen Mind Hunter. It's about the the start of the FBI uh, profiling program. So mm-hmm. that's them talking to. Uh, they just got to in the new season. They're getting to them talking to Charles Manson, uh, and there are some there are there are some really frightening characters in there. It's not played necessarily. So it's, it's, a, it's like it's, it's like not a horror series. Tales. It's supposed to be sort of it's a dramatization of how FBI the FBI profiling program came to be but there's there are a couple of serial killers they talk to uh there's one who says you know you, the only reason you'll ever catch us is because we get bored of the game and we're tired of you never being able to guess what we're doing and and we want to finally be known to people so that's that's why you catch us, That's which crazy. which is a, a scary That's thing, a scary notion. And that particular killer, I forget uh, who he is, but he does have a real life uh, uh, precedent. Is is you know, kind of a an odd but friendly fellow, calculating, but but don't would, you kind of have to but, be? Would seem dim witted to a lot of people because of his slow cadence. Yeah, but if but. You know, so that that's a if you're looking for a modern day sort of serial killer, that's what, a very good. What is that? Um, that plant uh, is it a Snapdragon? The Venus flytrap. Venus mm-hmm. flytrap. They like that. Yeah, it's like hey guys, they wait hey, for you to get, and that's what that's what sort of what Hannibal Lecter is. You yeah, know, lure you Venus into flytrap. I think the only, uh, I think the only thing we haven't gotten to so far is demonic possession. Ooh. That's something that's creepy. That's creepy, but also the uh, the most probably the most formulaic. You maybe even more formulaic than zombie movies, in its in its repetitive presentation of of the same thing. That, so we say the, the, that that has happened in movie. Every time you see a movie, it's sort of the same movie. So so every so everybody's remaking The Exorcist. Kind of yeah. It you seems know. a lot of movies. A lot of the movies, in, including you know the the first Conjuring, I think was decent. It did. I don't think it added a lot that was new. The Omen. The Omen. There's yes. There's the, the Omen is the original Omen. Mm-hmm. That they last night on uh, AMC they had the Omen Four, which mm-hmm. I watched about five minutes of, and I was like, this movie sucks. <laughs> I couldn't deal with it. But that original Omen with that kid, because mm-hmm. it's a cute kid. And he's he's the devil, mm-hmm. and they don't know it. And even when things are happening, 
that are like, this kid's the devil. The par- no one, st- there's no way this kid, mm. come on. It's, it's, that's the scariest. I think those can, if you can do one really well, they can be scary, but you know the beats to, to the basic right. plot of what's going to happen. You're going to get, and it, any of them where, uh, you know, well, Paul Tremblay just talked about this on an author's panel. The idea uh, of progressive horror is, is great. So, you know, taking it somewhere it hasn't been. any, As opposed to horror where the the point is that somebody steps in and restores the status quo. And a lot of demonic possessions are. Uh, somebody steps in and a priest comes in and, and the demon goes away and... That's the end of it. They've restored the status quo. Paul Tremblay wrote Head Full of Ghosts, which was about a demonic possession played with the idea of whether or not that really happened, whether or whether it was just in this, this girl's head. And the family still has to live with what happened. What about afterwards. the notion that the status quo is the scariest thing and maybe the demonic possession was somebody trying to right the wrong? Uh, that's why Stepford Wives uh, and Get Out is scary. Yeah. And there's those two two movies to me have a lot to do with each other. I, th- I think that uh, Jordan Peele looked a, a lot at, uh, at Stepford wives. There's a, a lot of the same sort of things uh, sort of happen in there, but he's obviously changed it more for, uh, for, for race than gender. Yeah. Black people watched that movie and was like, no, this is this every day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what about well? Where does us fit into that? Then I enjoyed us. I know I, a lot I of people didn't like seen it. That one. Yeah, that's a home invasion movie. That's sort of uh, that's uh, yeah. I don't know where that doesn't fit easily into a trope. Comedians are really good when it comes to horror. Mm-hmm. I think it's that that not that other like horror writers exclusively don't have imaginations, but. Ours is so wacky and active, and we we approach things from so many different weird angles. Mm. Horror is just like it's almost a natural fit. Who else would you put in that uh, category? Who does horror? Well, when I hear about, I mean, it's not not that I have anybody specific in mind, but in our conversation tonight, Bobcat, you yeah. know, comes out with stuff. Um, it was another name. Just slipped my just slipped. Danny McBride, you know, mm-hmm. helped pen the, the new Halloween movies. Um, uh, I can't think of anybody specific off the top, but but there are there is a horror and comedy have a lot in common. I've had this conversation frequently. Shaun I, of the I enjoy Dead. this, yeah, because you to me, uh, it's the it's a build up and release of tension, and the the build up in comedy you're supposed to build up and release attention. Hannah Gadsby had the great line about that about how oh you're thanking me for for relieving your tensions but no but I'm I'm the one that that made you tense in the first place. Why yeah. do you think this is an abusive relationship? Uh but horror is about keeping that tension sort of ratcheted up and not releasing it. And the comedy releases a little bit of that tension but not but only temporarily. So you get that sort of aerobic workout of of the tension building, the the release, but then realizing after that that humor provides a release that's only temporary, and you realize you're back in it after mm-hmm. that laugh. So it's that constant sort of uh, assault on your senses. You feel like if you watch a good movie that has good horror and good comedy, you're on point by the end of that movie. You're you know your eyes are open. You're you're leaning forward. Um, my favorite part of the omen is when they're going to church and they're driving towards the building, the church, and Damien's just freaking out, just freaking out, not handling it well. Uh-huh. And they're like, "Damien, calm down, Damien, Damien, what's wrong?" And I'm there, I'm like, "I'm the devil, bitch! Like I'm not <laughs> supposed to be going toward this place. <laughs> Get me out of here!" <laughs> Man. Yeah, and, and then of course there are infinite remakes of that, or or uh, infinite sequels to The Omen, which must get. I haven't watched them in a long time. I haven't. I've only seen a couple of the sequels of that. If you want to get me with a movie, say something like based on actual events mm-hmm. or true story or anything, even if it's loose. 
like the strangers. Uh huh. You know, they said that that's what got me. You know, and I I mean to the point where I'll go online and I'll look up what it's based on and I'll well, read home it. invasion. That's another aspect of where we didn't necessarily. Yeah, well, anything. strangers mm-hmm. would would fit. Uh, funny what was the movie called? Was it called Funny? Oh yeah, that that's you playing at the uh, Salem Horror Festival yesterday. Uh, funny something. Uh, my mind is. By the way, strangers, I didn't like when I saw it. I wasn't satisfied. It was a premise that could have been great. Uh, the Purge. The Purge. That's I guess another would one. be something along those lines, but I wasn't scared of um, the strangers. Mm-hmm. Once they were revealed to us, and at the you know this is the end with this this a blood curdling scream by I forget who played the I think it was Liv Tyler I don't know mm-hmm. and it was like that's what I'm supposed to be because they 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 built it up they said this will this the ending will stay with you well that's the toughest thing about horror is you can you you have to resolve the tension you have to or or you have to end it some way that doesn't resolve the te- the tension that makes sense it's it's hard to end horror it's i think it's it's easier to come up with a concept that seems scary and hooks people and puts them on edge but then you've got to say well what do i do with that now that i've got you on edge the only perfect horror movie ending was the one that wasn't halloween Mm -hmm. it was a perfect ending right and then you know he had he was forced to make a sequel but that ending where you finally think you've gotten rid of this person who you think is human somehow. Mm -hmm. And he just gets up and walks away and you don't know where he is and no one knows where he is. And they they love that shot of showing the different points of the house Mm -hmm. or places he had been Mm -hmm. throughout the night. And he's not in any of these places. And you're just like, you you know, it's a movie, Mm -hmm. but there's no result. There's nothing resolved. And he's out there. The freakiest thing to me about that show, Unsolved Mysteries, was that nothing was solved. Right. And when Robert Stack would say, and to this day, whatever he said after that, I think that freaks me out. I think that the, the unknown horror can, I, everybody wants to, to put a button on it. Everybody wants to, to find some neat, clean way to end their movie in, in horror. It works so much better if you don't. I mean, obviously, every rule is made to be broken, and somebody can, can right. them. But I'll get to say Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That ends because she found a truck that drove away at the end, and Leatherface is is stuck there with his throwing his chainsaw around, silhouetted in, uh, against the horizon, because he can't get her now anymore. But it didn't really. It got her out of danger, but those guys are still all there yep they, they, so it's there's there the original nightmare on elm street mm-hmm. he he pulls the girl the woman through the door so you know he's still out there but still it's like they know there's going to be a sequel mm-hmm. halloween it doesn't feel like there's going to be a sequel and no. now it does because you know the sequels but, but it feels like he's still out it there. feels like he's out there and it's the that's the creepiest shit. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's a Steven Seagal movie where he's he's chasing down the bad guy, and he goes, he says something like, um, "Anticipation is the scariest thing," or whatever. Like you, you know, you're gonna die, but you don't know when. And like I said to you on the way here, if the killer is right here, mm-hmm. I'm not scared anymore. We're gonna fight. I might not win, but I know what it's time for. Right, there's no more cat and mouse. There's no more cat and mouse. But if he's off in the distance or somewhere and I hear a noise here, that I can't handle. Right, because you saw something yeah. with the with the girl looking out the window. Yes, and seeing, that and book. Seeing, yeah. Or the book, yeah, the book that you read as a kid. Just like off in the distance and then spotting you. Uh, and then like now, next thing you know, it's on top of you or it's above you or Ooh, mm. that shit freaks me out. So let let's wrap up with what what makes a good Halloween for you. What's your best Halloween night? 
Um, as an adult, tons of candy, just kind of maybe alone in the dark watching horror movies. Mm. You know? Do you answer the door? Do you do you have? I don't candy? have. There's no kids in my neighborhood, mm. so I buy candy and stuff. I do buy candy, but I you know I don't give them out. <laughs> I don't give it out to anybody. I'm sad with our neighborhood because I love to decorate, and we get yeah. maybe three families a year come by. So I might actually. You know, we we might actually go out or do something this year because I want to celebrate. It's it's a it's a festive holiday That's to so me, great. and I can't. And and we, I I realize that okay, maybe it's a little creepy that we're gonna go to the forty seven year old childless childless man's house to get hand candy on uh, on Halloween, and he's decorated his house. I don't know. Maybe we've gotten a reputation. <laughs> maybe somebody has said, "Hey, you know they don't they don't have kids, and that guy loves Halloween." Maybe Halloween night itself is almost away. a sad night to me because it's over. Yeah, I like the season. That's why I start celebrating early. August first is when Halloween starts for me, and it's the anticipation of it. And there's count. They're like now with Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. There's like all these Halloween sort of countdowns. Which I like from November 1st through August 1st. Because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, we're getting closer. But on August 1st, I don't want to look at any more countdowns. Because now you're just counting down to when it's over for me. Right. And I don't I don't like that at all. But I, I just, I don't know. People have talked about how we start the holidays too early now. They talk with Halloween and, and with Thanksgiving and, and, th- and with Christmas. And I understand the impulse that... What they're saying is we're starting the commercial aspect of it mm-hmm. a little too, and and we're being sold goods. But nobody has it. to buy anything, right? Well, I still do love all this stuff. I do love going to to places and looking at the Halloween stuff, uh, all the 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 decorations and costumes and things. But to me, I'm in that spirit of that holiday. Uh, I will be in the Christmas spirit yep. sometime around Thanksgiving. I'm in the Halloween spirit almost all year round. I mean, you, yeah. We're in my basement right now, which is filled with DVDs and CDs and uh, and books. And there are horror books wherever you can you can look, and a, a shelf full of horror movies. And There's I, a dope Shaun of the Dead poster right in my eye line. Yes, which I forgot I had until we moved into the, to this place. I was very happy. There's a. a a movie poster for The Revelator, which is a movie that's on the festival circuit right now starring Boston comedian George McDonald. Huh. Uh, look for that. When that I got to see a, a preview screening of that. That's uh, hopefully I'm going to sit down with those guys sometime soon. They would, they would tell you like the sort of the creepiest thing that ever happened on Halloween when I was a kid trick-or-treating? No. Uh, Please do. I was, uh, I was like 11 and it was me, it was my younger brother, uh, one of my cousins, and like I don't know, three or four of our friends. We would always go like eight and nine deep. And and like you know, like you said earlier, how your grandmother would take you to different neighborhoods. Yeah. We would just go to different neighborhoods. We would walk to different neighborhoods, and we'd, we'd pillowcase. That's how we got down. Mm-hmm. No plastic trick-or-treat bags. Any kids listening, pillowcase. Maximize your candy. So we go to this one house. And open the, the knock on the trick or treat, you know. Guy answers the door. I would guess mid twenties, but when you're eleven, anybody over twenty years old is a hundred, right? Right. So, guy looked like he was in his twenties, late twenties, maybe even thirties, and he's like, "Hey, kids, oh, you guys look great." I'm like, thanks, <laughs> man. We're focused. We, we this is a business deal. We want the candy, <laughs> right? Like, oh, that's cute. Just, where's the briefcase. candy at? He invites us into his house. So this wasn't your, like, normally, you know, you trick or treat and they come out, give you the candy, and get out of here. He's come in. Come in. So we all go in the house. I look around this house. I didn't see, other than they had a table set up with bowls Mm -hmm. for the candy, but no place else in this house that I see furniture. And I saw about four or five other people sitting around on the floor just kind of sitting there talking. I don't know what they were saying. I take all this and stop. I go, okay, all right. Then the guy's telling us as we're getting candy, he's like, oh, they had all full-size bars. 
mm-hmm. all full size bars, and they let us help ourselves, <laughs> right? And then the guy says, "So kids, um, we're new to the neighborhood. We just moved in like a month or so ago. If you guys ever want to come over and hang out, just talk, whatever. Just come on through. We're always here for you, mm-hmm. right?" <laughs> And it's like, and I'll never forget this. My buddy Charles, also 11, said, and I quote, fuck that shit. (laughs) (laughs) And he took off. And I was about to take off, but I was too busy still filling my bag up with the candy. Uh I took about three or four or five more scoops. Then I grabbed my brother by his arm. I was like, we out. And we just bounced. Never went back to that house again. I don't know what happened to that house or to those people in that house. Uh. They could still be there for all I know. And they might not have been about anything. I don't remember. I don't know, I mean. But all I'm saying is it seemed in retrospect. At the time, I don't even think I mentioned it to my parents. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think it was something I was just kind of like, eh, okay. Well, because your experiences on Halloween were your experiences. Yeah. And unless there was something imminent, you probably wouldn't talk to your yeah. parents about it. That was part of the independence of Halloween, part of what makes the, the the thing special to begin with. Yeah. But when I got older and I thought back on it, I was like, they were trying to they were trying to kill us or something. Well, you know what, what, uh, what you have to do with that story now? Those guys need to be the people who teach – you and your crew about Applehead. <laughs> they need to be the good guys in the neighborhood who who seem like they're creepy at first, but no Applehead is in the neighborhood and are trying to tip you off to it <laughs> and can't just come right out and say it because you'll dismiss them as crazy. Yeah, that's how they. That's where they need. So to they come show back. up. There's a big rescue later. Uh, well, they, they well they show up. You start seeing. Uh, they they show up. Then you start seeing Applehead. Uh, and you're staying away from them because you think they're creepy, but eventually you're going to find those are the vampire slayers in your neighborhood, and they're the ones who come to the rescue, but you need to... And those you need are to, the vampire slayers in your neighborhood. <laughs> in your neighborhood. <laughs> these, yes. These are the slayers I know, I know. These are the slayers I know. Good old uh, Bob. <laughs> yes. So you have a Halloween episode uh, that you're filming soon. Yes, for my for, web series. Uh, web- Lamont's Boston, NBC 10, guys. Uh, I'm still writing it. Uh, it's probably going to be a lot about the sort of a combination of rules for Halloween mm-hmm. and kind of doing Halloween as an adult. And where can people find that when that comes out? You can catch it on the NBC 10 YouTube page. Uh the NBC 10 Instagram page, and some of it will be aired on NBC 10 itself. Mm -hmm. And where can people find out more about your stuff? You can check me out on Twitter at LPizzle, L-P-I-Z-Z-L-E, or on my Instagram at LPizzle12, L-P-I-Z-Z-L-E-1-2, or you can go to LamontPriceLive.com. Well, thank you for being here, and happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Lamont Price for sitting down to talk Halloween with me. Look for his Lamont's Boston segments on NBCBoston.com. And you can also find him on Twitter under L Pizzle and on Instagram under L Pizzle 12 and on his site at Lamont Price Live. And if you liked this or any other episode of the Department of Tangents podcast, please consider subscribing and or giving us a positive rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Radio Public, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on Spotify and YouTube, and you can find videos, reviews, essays, and other good stuff on the blog at www.departmentoftangents.com. Speaking of which, the Daily Horror Film Fest is on now over on the blog, a new short horror film every day through Halloween. Halloween. Some are scary, some are creepy, some are funny. Whatever kind of horror you enjoy, there will be something for you there. Our feature track this week is Collector of Things, the first track from the new Even Twice album, This is Boomerang. Believe it or not, Even Twice is just two guys, drummer, singer Pat O'Shea and bassist singer Bob Haight. They make a beautiful rock and roll racket together, and for a two-instrument band, they cover a lot of different styles on Boomerang. There is a driving punk edge sound at the heart of it, but sometimes it sounds like sludgy prog rock a la King Crimson's 20th Century Schizoid Man. 
Sometimes, as on Collector of Things, it sounds like 60s garage rock, rough around the edges but with a solid melodic center. You can find the new album on Spotify or better yet, buy it on Bandcamp. Find them on Twitter under at even twice and look them up on Facebook. This is Collector of Things off of This is Boomerang by Even Twice. Tell yourself that it can go no more. 